Well, I am going to talk about some of the things that I've been involved in in terms of research. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this countdown. And in fact, I'm definitely going to tee off of Johan Rockström's um, talk because I'm actually going to talk about three of these tipping points that he um, mentioned and that I actually have done research on. The question that I'm going to try to ask today, um, focusing on the, the IPCC assessment reports, is really how good of a job have the climate forecasts been? Um, and and um, therefore, um, you know, should we take them seriously and should we take them seriously going into the future? The earth is definitely undergoing a, trans, a transformation. Um, and uh, some people call this new era of the Anthropocene of, of man-made um, change to the earth. And, and Dr. Rockstrom definitely mentioned that. Um, one of the ways that we've been able to document this transition and this transformation is through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This group, um, sponsored by the United Nations, produces reports of peer-reviewed climate change research um, and all of the reports that they produce are also reviewed by the governments that sign the climate agreements. So for instance, the Paris Agreement that occurred a few years ago had to be approved by, by all the countries that were involved in those climate negotiations, which is, which is almost basically all the countries in the world. So the IPCC reports go through stringent, not only stringent scientific review of peer reviewed literature, that is, um, science for the sake of science, not, not um, reports done for industry. These are science that are, are reporting on science, as well as, as peer review through the government, that, through the governments that sign the agreements. So it's an extremely stringent um, um, process. And they produce every five to six, seven, eight years reports. And the first one came out in 1990. Well, in 1990, I was just finishing up my master's degree in geophysics. And in 1995, when the second report came out, I was just finishing my PhD. So you can see that this time period of these reports has really spanned my entire career because I'm, I'm kind of an old guy now. <laughs> um, but these have really been the source of, of all the information that we've learned about, about climate change and how we synthesize this over time. So this is a familiar curve, uh, hopefully to you, and it shows the increase in temperature. I do wanna mention that the 10 warmest years, um, eight of them have occurred in the last decade. So you can see that this decade, you know, decade by decade, since about the 1980s, um, we have definitely seen warmer and warmer and warmer decades as we've gone forward. Um, the other thing I wanna note is that back in 1990, when this first report came out and when I was still a young man, um, it wasn't clear. If you blot out all the, te the temperature data um, for the years since 1990, you can see that it wasn't clear back then whether or not we were facing, uh, what, face what future we were facing. But I'll, I hope to show you today that the IPCC reports, even back in 1990, gave us some hints at where we were headed. And then I'm gonna show you three examples of, of how the climate system has responded to these changes. So these are excerpts from the first report from 1990. You know, there is a natural greenhouse effect on earth that keeps our planet warmer than it otherwise would be. We didn't have the greenhouse effect, we'd be a frozen rock. But the emissions resulting from human activities release carbon dioxide and, and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. These increases will enhance the greenhouse effect. If they're not removed from the atmosphere, they increase the greenhouse effect and that's gonna result in warming. So the fact that this has occurred is now directly attributable to those increases in greenhouse effect. It's not natural variability. This down here is natural variability. This, what we've seen since the, since the 1980s is no longer uh, natural. Um, another thing is, is that they predicted that the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets may still be responding to the last ice age, um, but we'll see that that actually is not true. And as Dr. Rockstrom um, uh, mentioned, 
the climate system is responding a lot faster than we were able to, than we predicted back 30 years ago. A couple other things that the high northern latitudes, the Arctic region would be the one of the first places where we would see warming. Um, we would see reduced sea ice extent and thickness, which is which I'll, I'll prove to you and show you from the data that we have that that's true. Um, they forecasted little uh, change in the extent of Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets, but this has actually not happened because of new science that has occurred in the last 30 years that show the effect of the warm that the warmer oceans are having on these ice sheets in terms of greater um, discharge of icebergs from both from both of these ice sheets. And then finally, um, the effect of, of wildfires. Um, we can see that potentially serious changes have been identified even in 1995 in the second report that include um, high temperature events, so forth, um, with resulting consequences from fires. And I will mention forest fires here in a minute. So just really quickly, I'm gonna go through some data. We're gonna focus on the high Northern latitudes because this is one of the things that I remember learning about early on in the nineties is that the Arctic and then and the, and the, that would be the first place that we would see the changes. And I'll give two examples, sea ice and Greenland. And then I want to bring this home to how it is affecting um, you and, and myself and people in this region and even locally. So to, to impress upon you the fact that even though we're experiencing global climate change, we in fact are beginning to see the effects regionally and locally, even in our own backyard. So this is a picture of the seasonal cycle of sea ice. Sea ice grows in the winter and reaches a maximum year after year in March. It then starts to decrease as the um, Arctic gets warmer and it reaches a minimum in September. And in fact, we just reached this minimum. This blue line right here is 2020. So we've got a lot of curves here that show the seasonal cycle. These are all the years that we have satellite data from, from 79 to 2020. If I take all the years from 81 to 2010 and I average them, I get this black line here. And the variability over that time period is shown as these shaded colors. But what we've also shown here is 2012, which we, where we had the minimum, and 2020, where we set the second lowest Arctic uh, extent of sea ice ever recorded um, um, in the satellite record. We can also see that right now, this blue line appears to be crossing this red line, which means that when it does that, we are going to have the lowest sea ice extent of, of any time in late October that we've ever recorded in the last several decades. So this is what it looks like comparing the 19, September 1980 to September 2020. You can certainly um, sail a boat right through this ocean in, in the summertime now, as opposed to uh, 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 you know, uh, 40 years ago, you weren't able to do that. So things are changing, and this is a direct consequence of a, a warming planet. Secondly, the thing that I wanna ha have you concentrate on are the colors here. Over here, we can see a combination of blue and red colors on the left. This is the this 1970s from 72 to 80. Again, this is um, this record of mass balance of how much ice is on Greenland was derived from satellites that began in, in the 70s. So we can see that some portions of Greenland back in the 70s were gaining mass. That's why the, the colors are blue and some were, were losing, but there was a mixture. As we go forward in time across the screen here, you can see that in the, in the 2010s, all of the circles are red. Um, the dark red is discharge, is the change in the amount of icebergs that are coming off the, of the, uh, the Greenland ice sheet. And the light colors are the amount of melting, which is something that I've, I've been interested in my own research. So it turns out that Greenland is a much more significant, the melting and discharge of ice from Greenland is a much more significant contributor to sea level rise than was predicted um, even in, in the, the, the first, second, third reports of the, of the IPCC. 
The final thing is, is re bringing it home. Now, regional wildfires, um, this is a, um, from a, a report by NASA. Um, they, they have six trends. I'm gonna focus on three just real quickly. There are more fires. You can see that this, uh, this line going up from, uh, from the, the 1800s here forward is showing um, that there are more fires going in time and those fires are larger. They're hotter and larger. Um, this all points to the fact that wildfires are going to have a big impact on our future, especially in the Western US. And you can see the effects here. Um, and we know this um, on, because a, a month ago, we had this horrendously poor air quality in our area from fires that were burning in central Oregon or actually in central Western Oregon around um, Eugene and Salem. And those were generating enormous amounts of, of smoke that went really all the way to Europe and were visible there. And so our air quality in Spokane reached a record high of 479. The previous high, that almost doubled the previous high that was set in 2018. So we're seeing historic fires with historically bad um, air quality. I wanna note that the AQI, the air quality index, if it gets over 500, which it did uh, over much of, the, of this area, that is beyond, beyond the, EPA's, the EPA's scale for health effects of smoke. So it's not even hazardous, it's hazardous, it's beyond hazardous. So these fires are getting larger and they're occurring more often and they're affecting a larger portion of the West and they're creating bad air quality, which affects human health. So in conclusion, global climate change is a, a lot more than just a rising temperature of the earth. There are lots of impacts. Um, humans are already experiencing the, experiencing the effects both globally and locally. The earth's temperatures are gonna continue to rise as long as we continue to emit greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and, and without removing them somehow. Therefore, we can expect the impacts to increase and worsen, which we're beginning to see. We're definitely seeing the effects now. Overall, the IPCC predictions have been remarkably good. They're focused on the high latitudes, the high northern latitudes, the effect of sea ice. Um, the, as time went on, we had better predictions of what was happening with Greenland and Antarctica, and our focus on climate allowed us to learn new processes that are accelerating as climate change is, is occurring and are causing sea level to rise even faster than we expected. And unfortunately, a number of these things have been underestimated. And so we, um, we, we, you know, we expect to see more of this in the future until we deal with this problem. But getting to what Dr. Pajeski said in closing, I don't want you to be paralyzed. I want this to hopefully be a wake up call We've been working on this a long time. Climate science has been producing this message. It needs to be consumed in a way that creates action. And we must connect with each other. Scientists um, need to connect with people. We've been trying to get our message out for 30 years, but we need to continue to do that. And we need, need to do it by reaching out and, and encompassing as many people as we can into this problem because it's gonna take a lot of us to solve it, but it absolutely is solvable. So don't be paralyzed and make sure you connect with each other, even those that may not um, uh, think the same way you do. Thank you very much.